everybody. My name is Kirsten Larson and I'm the programming director for Milwaukee Film. And I'm so happy to be able to host tonight our conversation with the director of the film Herb Alpert is, director John Scheinfeld, who is a Milwaukee native working all the way out in LA. So we like to get our representation all across the country. And uh, we're very excited to be able to talk with him tonight about his great documentary. So hello, John. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. Hi, Kirsten. Thanks for having me. Happy to uh, virtually be back in my hometown. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm going to start out with a few questions, but just so everybody out in cyberspace knows, you can submit your questions on whatever platform you're watching on. So Facebook, YouTube, doesn't matter. Just type it in the chat and it'll pop up here so we can talk about it on screen for all of you. But uh, to start out, I'll have an easy question, which is, why did you decide to make this documentary? Well, it's all my mother's fault. When I was uh, growing up in Milwaukee, my mom had all of Herb's albums, and uh, I, have, I have very strong memories of, of her playing those albums and dancing around the house because the music is so happy. And, and I always registered that, and so Herb was always on my radar, if you will, and as I got uh, older and moved to California, uh, became more aware of Herb's career and what he had accomplished. Um, and, and as a filmmaker, I'm always sort of thinking what would be fun to do next? What, what would be the next thing? And uh, Herb, last maybe four or five years, it was on my list. There was maybe Herb Alpert. That might be kind of interesting. Uh, and, uh, but never really thought too much about it uh, until um, I had met Herb when I was making another film. Uh, uh, about Sergio Mendez, a world music artist. It's called Sergio Mendez in the Key of Joy, which will be coming out later this year. But um, got a chance to meet Herb and had an idea of, of, of how I wanted to approach his remarkable story and uh, went out there, talked to Herb and his wife, Lonnie, and pitched my vision of the film, and here we are. Well, it turned out great, and it is a very happy film. So I'm glad we we're able to watch it in these trying times. Um, the truth, you bet. <laughs> so I'm curious because you've made many, many documentaries and so many of them are about the music business and musicians. Um, what originally drew you to doing these documentary features about uh, musicians? Well, it's a great question. Uh, I'm a horrible musician, so it can't be that. Uh, I, took, uh, I took piano lessons for six years, and I think I remember a few chords of chopsticks, and that's about it. Um, but I love music, and it figures very prominently in my life. Uh, I had radio shows when I was in college and graduate school, and when I'm working, there's music blasting from the speakers uh, almost all the time, and also in the car when I'm driving. Uh, but I think to, to be able to make a documentary about a musician that has some richness and texture to it, um, you have to understand the soul of a musician. And although I'm not one, for some reason, I, have, I understand the soul of a musician and I understand how to get sort of through the layers of the onion to the heart of, of what really makes a musician, what really makes their art. And I really enjoy that. And each musician that I've done, whether it's John Lennon or John Coltrane or Herb Alpert or Harry Nilsson or even the Bee Gees, um, it's uh, uh, somebody whose work I really admire. And, and I think that's also really important. I think if, if there's some aspiring filmmakers watching uh, today, um, I think that's really important. If you're doing something just for the money, I always feel the work isn't quite as good. If you're going to have to spend nine to 12 months with a subject, which is often how long it takes me to doc, uh, make a feature documentary, I think you better really love your subject. And uh, I think if you do, uh, it shows on screen. Absolutely. That is a perfect segue into my next question, because I think it's so evident in the film, the admiration you have for Herb. And I'm curious how, when you're making a, documentary about a subject who's still alive, how do you get to know your subject and grow more comfortable with them as you're about to spend a whole year with them making a film? 
Uh, again, that's a, a really great question because uh, uh, I, I have done a lot of people who are no longer with us. And that has its own uh, set of challenges where you don't have the subject to really open up and, and tell you what they were thinking or feeling at a particular time in their career. So you have to depend on other people to do it. Or in, in the case of my film Chasing Train about John Coltrane, um, Coltrane ha hadn't done any television interviews or radio interviews that, that, where the sound was good enough but he did a lot of print interviews. So I had a lot of his words and I thought, well, you know, for that one, I want to go get a movie star. So uh, I got Denzel Washington to speak the words of Coltrane. So uh, while it wasn't exactly narration and he wasn't exactly alive, I was able to pick and choose some quotes from Coltrane's uh, print interviews that would inform what, what was going on in his life and career at a particular time. Um, but here with Herb, because Herb is still with us, uh, he's 85 and he is going like a house on fire. Uh, he just uh, before the virus, he was doing 50 or 60 dates a year at performing arts centers around the country and jazz clubs. Uh, as you'll see in the film, he gets up every morning and he practices and and he paints and he sculpts and he makes music. And uh, it's just, I, I hope I have that energy uh, when I'm half his age. Actually, I am half his age, but <laughs> you get it. Um, uh, but there are certain challenges because yes, you, you really want to feel that you have earned the trust of the subject so that they will open up and talk to you. I don't mean revealing dirt or tabloidy kind of information. I don't mean that, but so you, don't get the same old, same old answers. You want to really dig a little deeper and feel that your subject is comfortable enough with you that they will uh, uh, tell you um, really what they're thinking and feeling. And with Herb, I had the advantage of uh, going out and spending time with him uh, for three months before we actually started production of the picture. And over those three months, we'd have lunch, we'd walk, we'd talk and, and listen to music or whatever. And I think over that period of time, he began to feel very comfortable with me. And in fact, his manager said to me at one point, I had asked her to, he said, I, I want to get you and your band playing a few songs that we can pepper throughout the film. And uh, he, I, I don't think her really wanted to do it, but he did do it. And one of them uh, figures very prominently in the uh, love story section of the film. Uh, and, uh, but his manager said, you know, he trusts you so much he did it. And I, and I think the other thing that's interesting when you have a live subject is how best to present them on screen. Is it a, a straight ahead uh, uh, talking head like we are now uh, with a background uh, uh, or can you do something different? And what I learned about Herb is his personality really comes out when he's walking and talking, less so when he's sitting in a chair. And so that's why I decided let's take him back to the house uh, that he grew up in. Let's take him back to his elementary school. Let's take him back to the A&M records lot, which is a very magical place. And he hadn't been there in many, many years. And he felt so comfortable that I think the stories just poured out of him in those places. And uh, the film is much better as, as a result of that. Yeah, I think those strategies all definitely show through in the movie. Uh, a lot of the conversations are very natural and authentic. So I think you did a great job. Um, we have a question from the audience and just a reminder to everybody out watching right now, if you have a question, you can submit it on whatever social media platform you're on and it'll pop up on our screens. Um, so our question is with using historical footage and music, how do you go about getting the rights? And do you have a lawyer that you work with? Um, and I feel like you see this in a lot of movies where it's so hard to get musical rights for things. So I can only imagine as a musical documentarian, that would be something you work with all the time. Uh, it is true. So thank you for the question. Um, each film is different because each uh, artist uh, is associated with a different record label did more or less television or concerts or what have you. So each landscape uh, has to be navigated on its own. Uh, Herb happily 
uh, is a saver. So he saved hundreds, if not thousands of photographs. He saved videos, he saved film, he saved memorabilia. And it was all in this closet in a, the basement of his office building in Santa Monica, California. And uh, to walk in there, it was like walking into just a vault filled with jewels because everything in there was very valuable for us uh, as, as the filmmaking team. Uh, but the question, everything in there is owned by someone. Herb may own some of the photos, uh, maybe he didn't own others. Uh, in the case of the video, he did three television specials uh, at the end of the 1960s and he owns those, so we could use as much of those as we wanted to. But then there were other pieces of, of, of footage that we had to clear. So I have a clearance person, not a lawyer, but I have a clearance person who has done this for many, many years. And what we uh, do is identify the uh, owner of the material. Even though Herb may physically have it, somebody may own it, whether it's him or someone else. So if he did not own it, uh, we then went to them and you make what's called a license agreement where you are licensing the use of that for the film. Um, this also applies to music. There are 63 songs in this film, which for any film is uh, a tremendous amount, but for a documentary on a documentary budget, it can be quite challenging. But over the years, I have figured out how best to do this. So in my John Coltrane film, we had about 50 songs. In my Harry Nilsson film, we had 53. My John Lennon film, we had 56. And what you have to do is get very creative about the deal making uh, and, and get the owners of the material to really support your vision of the film and to give you a deal that will make it possible. So um, it's all a bit uh, of a negotiation, uh, but yes, everything has to be clear. There's a uh, a, a provision called fair use, which documentarians uh, utilize sometimes, which uh, for a film clip, for a photo, for a song, if you use a very, like under 10 seconds, you can claim fair use uh, and not have to pay. But uh, because I like to feature a lot of material, um, we always like to do it the right way and, and clear it properly and pay for it. Definitely. Um, we have another question from the audience, and I think this is definitely something a lot of people will be interested in for this uh, conversation, since you are from Milwaukee originally, um, is someone is asking, why is it so hard for independent filmmakers to break into the Hollywood industry, which I think could also translate into a question about uh, how your filmmaking career started from being here in Milwaukee to going uh, to be such a prolific documentarian. Um, so if you have thoughts on either question, definitely. Sure, I appreciate the question. It looks like it's from Bobby. So Bobby, here's the answer. Um, one must be persistent. One must be dedicated. One must really want it. Um, Hollywood is a place where there are hundreds of aspiring filmmakers getting off uh, the plane every week trying to find their way out here. And I do remember when I was living in Milwaukee, if I had a dollar for everybody that said to me, oh, you know, Hollywood is so far away. It's so competitive. There are so many people. Said, if I had a dollar for everybody who said to me, you'll never make it, uh, I would have been so rich, I wouldn't have had to come to California. <laughs> but, but, I had decided probably when I was 11 years old that I, I wanted to, to come out here and write, produce, and direct something. I, it wasn't documentaries specifically, but my folks had taken me to the Fox Bay Theater, uh, Silver Spring in, in Whitefish Bay, and we looked at uh, Lawrence of Arabia. And I remember just going, I was blown away by the acting, the directing, the shooting, uh, everything about it said to me, this is something I had to be part of. And I wouldn't take no for an answer. And so I think that's the first thing. Um, also talent is helpful. <laughs> I think you wanna make sure that you have, you find the right avenue to exploit your talents. Um, 
I, I'm sort of an ideas person and I was always gravitating towards the kind of jobs where I could have an idea, have a creative idea and then try to pursue it. Uh, there are some people that are more doers that uh, if someone says, all right, this is what we're going to do. They're great at executing that and, and handling that. Um, but I would say, uh, Bobby, as a filmmaker, what you want to be is a creative person. So you want to have the ideas and you want to have fresh ideas and have fresh, fresh approaches to those ideas. Um, and that's really something that's within you or it's not within you. And you have to recognize that. Uh, and then come out here and I think find the best way to get to that. Over the years, I've met with a lot of young people um, from Milwaukee or not that uh, have, have wanted to come and talk about how, how best to get into the business. And uh, 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 people often say, oh, you know, I'll do anything for a first job. And I said, I know you will. I said, but doing anything isn't necessarily going to get you where you want to be. Uh, if you want to be a director, maybe craft services or being a messenger isn't really the best way to do it. If you want to be a writer, maybe the best way is to go to work in a writer's room where you can work for other writers. Uh, so there are lots of different ways. So I guess uh, overall my suggestion would be kind of um, focus in on what it is you want to do and then figure out what's the best kind of a beginning job that would get me there. You don't want to be over here if what you want to do is be over there. And so, I would say be creative about how you find uh, that first job uh, as you are about the work that you're going to do. And I think I'll just add one other thing. Uh, you're going into a creative field and you need to be able to sell yourself creatively. So when I uh, wanted to uh, move from Milwaukee to Hollywood, I had to figure out what's the best way to get people who are hiring to pay attention to me because of those hundreds of people that were getting off the plane and the bus and the car all the time. So um, now this is some years ago. And so I don't, I didn't have the advantages that people have now where you can practically edit a whole film in your room. Uh, we didn't have internet. We didn't have cell phones. We didn't have any of that when I first got my job out here. Um, but I, what I did is I said, I, I want something that no one else is doing. So I put together, a uh, it would look like a reprint of an article in People magazine about John Scheinfeld. So I stole the cover, uh, the, the logo, I put me on the cover, and it was you know, direct from Milwaukee, John Scheinfeld. And then if you opened up the resume, I didn't use the form that we all used in school, but rather I wrote a breezy, gossipy style, people style magazine article about John Scheinfeld. And if they didn't read that, and I wasn't sure they were going to, I peppered the whole thing with pictures with one line captions of significant events in my life that I thought would help sell me to an employer. And I sent about 50 of these out to studios, networks, producers, and um, I got 20 responses. And 20 responses out of 50 is fantastic. Now, you know, 12 of them said, sorry, we don't have anything for you, but eight said, yeah, you know, come and see us. And uh, I was quite lucky. Um, I came out on a Sunday uh, to Hollywood. By Friday, I had a job. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was all due to that resume, that they had not seen anything like it. And I think what it said is, this kid is smart and creative, and we can teach him how we do things at our place. And it was worth taking a, a flyer on me. So long answer to your question, sorry. I, it was a wonderful answer, very uh, in-depth. So thank you so much for that. Um, so I am curious because I feel like all of us Midwesterners out here are uh, so unique from everyone out in LA or at least people who are from there. Do you think anything from growing up in Milwaukee has influenced you in your filmmaking career or your style that you do with your filmmaking? I believe so. Um, I think uh, growing up in the Midwest, I, I, I will say this, and, and, and um, I feel like a, a lot of my friends will, would agree with this who are from the Midwest, is that those of us that do come from there are a little more grounded, a little more real, a little more authentic, a, a little less Hollywood or New York. And I think that serves us well as co-workers. Uh, but I think it also um, figures into how I approach 
uh, the work that I do. Um, I started Herb Alpert Is two years ago. Um, and, but even then I was starting to think there's a lot of darkness in the country at that time coming out of Washington. And, and, you, and, and when I watched television or movies, there, there were many, many projects that were dark and depressing and edgy and gritty and dystopian and apocalyptic. And I just said, you know, I'm tired of that. I want to do something that inspires people or uplifts people or entertains people or makes them nostalgic or that's fun. And that's really where this came from. Uh, but I also feel those of us from Milwaukee, I generally are more positive, more relentlessly optimistic, more that the glass will always be half full kind of people. And I think I do bring that to, to the work that I do. You don't see me doing dark and edgy, tabloidy, um, you know, the, the, the worst quality of human being kind of film. I'm much more celebratory or much more interested in understanding what makes an artist and, and what has helped shape their art. Absolutely. I find that very refreshing as someone who has to watch a lot of dark documentaries. <laughs> um, so another question from the audience is when you're in pre-production, how much pre-writing do you do on what the film will look like? Or do you mostly do the interviews and clips and then uh, figure out the structure after the fact? Well, uh, it's interesting. I've spoken to a few classes over the years and I get a very similar kind of question is, um, do you write the script uh, or how long is your script before you start production? And there, for me, there is no script before production. Uh, I don't know how one could do a script without doing your research, without doing your interviews, without really knowing all the nuances of your story. So I find it irresponsible, not only creatively, but financially, to go shoot a bunch of material and then go into the editing room and try to figure out what is this. And I think sometimes when, when you come away from a film and, and you're feeling this really wasn't very successful. I think it's because maybe the vision wasn't clear enough, wasn't strong enough that it could then be carried out. So what I do in pre-production, I usually spend about two or three months in, in pre-production, maybe a little longer, uh, where I'm simply just doing research. I'm reading, I'm looking at film clips, I'm listening to music, um, I'm considering who I want to be in my film to be interviewed. And when I do that, um, I very much approach um, that like casting, like you would cast a scripted film. I want uh, unique voices, unique perspectives. I don't want anyone else to speak like three other people in the film. So I want every point of view to be very different. So I kind of lay all of that out. And then having done the research, I know the questions I want to ask. And once I know that, uh, then I can really ask questions that I think are going to draw out very lengthy and revealing answers from my subjects. One of the first things you learn, of course, is don't ever ask a question that could be answered with a simple yes or no. Like, was that fun for you? Yes. You know, okay, well, all right, that's your answer. Now what are you going to do with that for a documentary? Um, what I want to do, I'm less interested, actually, as a documentarian with what happened, although that is important. Uh, as how they feel about what happened. So with Herb Alpert, for example, um, he would tell me um, that his initial success with the Tijuana Brass just came out of nowhere. He made this little record and it was a huge success. So I didn't say, well, tell me, how did you make that record? I mean, he, did, he gave me a little bit of that, but my question to him was, all right, so you had this amazing success that you weren't expecting. How did that make you feel? And what you get from a question like that is something that's very deep, very emotional. And uh, the other trick that I learned a long time ago is you don't jump in right away with your next question. When somebody finishes speaking, I just go, oh. And somebody will then oftentimes jump in to fill the silence and keep telling me more. Uh, and sometimes 
you will come across story points that you could not have anticipated in your research because the subject has never told the story before. For example, when I was making the U.S. versus John Lennon, um, we uh, interviewed Yoko Ono three times uh, over a period of nine months. First time was kind of general framework questions. Second time we got more specific. Third time was we were filling in story holes that we had. But um, for one of the interviews, I just asked her, I wish I could tell you it was a great question. It wasn't, it was a very benign question, but had to be asked. Uh, and uh, she and John did this bed in, in in Canada. And I said, so what was your favorite moment of the bed in? Not a great question. But she thought for a second and she said, oh, you won't like this. Let's move on. And I said, no, no, no. I could see that something occurred to you. What? What was, no, 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 you won't like this. Let's, 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 let's keep going. So it became like four and a half minutes of cajoling her into telling this story. And, and finally, because she felt comfortable, she ended up telling the story. And, and she said, you know, it was the end of the day and the press was gone and all of our handlers were gone. It was just John and me alone in the hotel room. And Kirsten, I don't know where this story is going, but I love it already because now I'm a fly on the wall in their hotel room. And she says, you know, there was a, a skylight up in the ceiling and John looks through and there's this beautiful full moon. And, and, and John looks at me, Yoko says, and said, isn't this great? Here we are promoting peace and love and we have both. And her attorney was sitting next to me and I said, that's in the movie. And, and I said to her, why, you know, why were you hesitating about telling the story? And it wasn't because it was too personal as it, as it turned out. She felt it was not big enough, that it was such a small story, I wouldn't be interested. And I said, oh, no, 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 no. And this is really part of the, of the advice I would have for aspiring filmmakers is there's no story that's too small. Uh, oftentimes it's the small stories that will tell you volumes about your subject. And so it was a small story, but it said a lot about the love story between John and Yoko. So that became very important. And the film would have been far worse off for not having it in it. Well, thank you so much. And I'm definitely going to steal those tips for my next Q&A. Um, but we're about to run out of time. So I just wanted to close out with one more question, which is, what are you working on next? Well, thank you for asking. Um, it's actually a, a good time for documentary filmmakers. Uh, we don't have 50, 75 people uh, around a set as you do on a scripted film or scripted TV show. And, uh, and, and the challenges of pe keeping people safe are, are quite great there, which is why a lot of projects are not going into production. But our crews are five, six, seven people, and so we're doing okay. So I started a new film, feature documentary, uh, a month ago. I can't tell you too much about it because we haven't announced it yet. We're going to announce it somewhere in the next month. But uh, I will say that it blends music, politics, social commentary, and a mystery all around one of the hottest bands of 1970. So I can tell you that. And then we're also uh, in negotiations with the Fox Network to do a uh, primetime documentary celebrating the TV series Married with Children which is kind of interesting. And then there's a few other things sort of uh, floating around in various stages of finding money. This is the other thing for aspiring filmmakers uh, who are watching is they don't always tell you this when you're in film school or in school, uh, that a, a lot of your time is gonna be spent raising money and not actually making the film itself. And uh, so that's always part of, of my job is how, how are we gonna pay for this? Well, those all sound very interesting secret one is very intriguing. So we'll all keep an eye out for that. Um, and in the meantime, everybody should check out Curb Alper is on our Sofa Cinema website and uh, you'll have some time to watch it. So don't worry, it's not going away anytime soon. And thank you so much, John, for talking with us. And we'll have to have you come back and do some more stuff with us when we can meet again in person. Would love to. Thanks for having me. And uh, thank you, Milwaukee. And please do go see Herb Alpert is. I'm, I'm very proud of it. I think you'll come out smiling and feeling great. All right, everybody. Thank you. Good night.